On a clear April morning, a sleek little RV-12 experimental plane blasted down the runway in North Carolina. But just a minute later, it was skimming so low over a busy highway that people could see the pilot's faces, heading straight for an overpass. Seconds later, it smashed in, flipped upside down, and exploded in flames. One pilot was dead, the other barely survived. But here's the crazy part. The real cause of this wasn't some random mechanical fluke or a bad decision in the last few seconds. No. The chain of destruction started years earlier, with a decision so simple it might make you think, how could that possibly matter? But it did, and it killed someone. So, first, let's talk about the airplane. This wasn't your everyday Cessna or Piper. This was a 2021 RV-12, an experimental amateur-built aircraft. Now, if you're not a pilot, here's what that means in plain English. It's basically a kit plane built by a private owner, not by a certified factory. That gives the builder a ton of freedom. You can choose your own engine, avionics, paint, whatever. But here's the trade-off. There's no big manufacturer keeping you in line. You, as the builder, own every single piece of responsibility for how it's built, maintained, and flown. In this case, the owner, Glenn Miller, decided not to go with the standard Rotax 912 engine that most RV-12 use. Instead, he went with a Viking 1 to 10, essentially a car engine from a Honda Fit that's been converted for aircraft use. On paper, it's a clever and affordable choice. But here's the thing, and this is where the story gets really frustrating. When you bolt an auto engine onto an airplane, you must follow the manufacturer's fuel and maintenance rules to the letter. Viking's manual is crystal clear. Never run lower grade fuels. It can and will destroy your engine. And yet, for the first nine hours of this engine's life, Glenn ran it on 87 octane automotive gas. That's the cheap stuff you'd put in a base model sedan, and it's below the 89 octane minimum Viking required. Why does that matter? Octane is basically a measure of how resistant fuel is to detonation. And detonation is bad news. That's when the fuel-air mixture inside the cylinder explodes all at once instead of burning smoothly. It's like hitting the piston with a sledgehammer thousands of times a minute. Over time, it can literally melt and shatter engine parts, like, say, spark plug tips. But the low octane wasn't the only issue. After those first few hours, Glenn left the airplane mostly idle for almost two years. Half a tank of that old auto gas sat there the whole time, with just a fuel additive mixed in. Viking's manual actually warns against leaving auto fuel in the system for more than three months. They say switch to aviation fuel for long-term storage. Glenn never did. And during those two years, no one inspected or replaced the spark plugs, even though the airplane had a condition inspection just seven months before the accident. Now... I'm not saying Glenn woke up one morning thinking, let's damage the engine, but these choices, cheap gas early on, old fuel, sitting for years, skipped spark plug checks, they built up hidden damage, and that damage was sitting there, waiting for the right moment to show up. Fast forward to April 11th, 2023. The weather's perfect. Clear skies, light winds, Greensboro Executive Airport in Climax, North Carolina. In the right seat is James Jimmy, Anthony Foking, 39 years old, a commercial pilot but not flying for hire. Earlier that morning, he'd already taken the RV-12 up solo. No hiccups, no warning signs. Now it's time for a second flight. In the left seat is Curtis Dale Williams, 52, also a commercial pilot, and the one flying this time. The plan? A phase one test flight focused on aerodynamic stall testing. Remember, this airplane was still in phase one, meaning it wasn't done with its required 40 hours of test time in a restricted area. They had about 22 hours log total. Before takeoff, they top off with 12 gallons of 93 octane autogas. On paper, 93 is fine, above the minimum requirement. But there's a catch. You don't instantly purge all that old gas from the system. If there's still any of that two-year-old low-octane additive-laden fuel in there, and there almost certainly was, it mixes right in. And if the spark plugs were already damaged from past detonation, you've got a ticking clock. At 11.31 a.m., they roll down runway 35. The takeoff looks smooth at first, 
They climb out, maybe 400 feet above the ground, and then it hits. The engine's RPM drops, power fades, but it doesn't quit. And here's where it gets tricky. Partial power loss is actually more dangerous in some ways than a full failure. With a full failure, you know you have to land right now. With partial power, your brain is fighting you. It's whispering, maybe it'll come back, maybe we can make it back to the airport, and that delay can kill you. They bank left once, then again, lining up with US-421, a long straight highway running parallel to the runway. They're low, they're slow, and the clock is ticking. So now they're at treetop level, the airport sliding away behind them, and the RV-12 is pointed south over US-421. To get there, they've already made two tight left turns, the kind you only make when you know you're not climbing anymore. Out in front, a four-lane highway with a 60-foot wide grass median, light traffic, and over 4,300 feet of open pavement before the next major obstacle. Now, for you and me, sitting here after the fact, that looks like the perfect off-airport landing zone. The runway's gone, you've got a straight shot, the airplane's still controllable. You'd think this is the moment to just set it down, but in the cockpit, it's not that simple. With partial power, your brain is still whispering, just a little farther, maybe we can clear this next thing. That's the trap. And there was a next thing. Dead ahead, the Monette Road overpass, with a full-sized semi-truck parked right underneath it. And just beyond that, multiple low-voltage power lines stretching across the entire highway. That is the nightmare scenario for a highway landing. Because at this altitude, those wires are essentially invisible until you're seconds away. The FAA has been warning pilots about this for years in safety alerts and training materials. Roads are tempting, but they hide hazards that can kill you. Wires, light poles, unexpected vehicles. And it's worth pointing out something here from FAR 91.119. Pilots are supposed to operate at an altitude where, if the engine quits, they can make an emergency landing without undue hazard to people or property. Down low, over a populated road, you've taken that margin away. At this point, Williams and Foking were boxed in. That open stretch of highway behind them, gone. All that's left now is an overpass, a truck, and wires. And that's where the split-second gamble came in. Their choice, and I don't use this lightly, was a razor-thin one. Try to fly under the power lines, but over the overpass. Think about that for a second. That's like threading a needle with a running chainsaw in your hands. To do it, Williams banked the RV-12 hard, the left wing going nearly vertical. The margin for error here was basically zero, and they didn't have it. The left wing clipped the railing of the overpass, the airplane flipped inverted, and slammed down the hillside just beyond. Impact was brutal. The wreckage ended up compact, upside down, with a post-impact fire ripping through the cockpit. Foking was already partially outside the fuselage. Motorists on the highway ran in and pulled him clear. Williams, trapped inside, suffered blunt force injuries, severe burns, and smoke inhalation. He didn't make it. And for the survivor? This was just the start of a long, painful road. Foking spent months in ICU and in burn rehab. It wasn't until about five months later that he was able to return home, where the community welcomed him back with open arms. At the scene, investigators found the propeller splintered into pieces, two blades lying in the debris field. The engine itself hadn't blown up. It was intact. But when they pulled the spark plugs from cylinders one and two, the damage was unmistakable. The electrode tips were gone. Now, here's where it gets really clear what happened and why it was avoidable. Those obliterated spark plug tips from cylinders one and two, they could still spark at low pressure, but under the high compression of normal operation, they just gave up. That's why the engine ran, but with so little power. And this wasn't from the impact. The NTSB ruled that out. This was from detonation damage that had been building for years. Detonation, remember, is when the fuel-air mixture explodes instead of burning smoothly. It hammers the internals, overheats them, and in this case, it literally destroyed the plugs. The root cause? Those first nine hours on 87 octane fuel that Viking specifically warns never to use, combined with almost two years of old auto gas sitting in the system. No spark plug replacement, no purge with proper storage fuel, but, and this is important, the engine damage wasn't the only link in the chain. The human factors here are huge. 
The NTSB points out that partial power failures are about three times more common than total failures. And according to ATSB research, they're more dangerous because they create decision paralysis. With a total failure, you're committed to landing right now. With partial power, you start bargaining with yourself. You wait, you troubleshoot, and you eat up precious seconds until your options vanish. This airplane's landing distance? 525 feet. They had over 4,000 feet of highway early on. That's the one thing that's hard to swallow here. If they'd put it down there, it would have been ugly for the airplane, sure. But both pilots would almost certainly be alive. And that's the bitter truth of this crash. Glenn Miller's fuel and storage choices, long-term engine damage, partial power failure on climb, hesitation, forced into a no-win choice at the overpass, fatal impact. If there's one takeaway, it's this. In a partial power scenario, right after takeoff, don't wait for it to get worse. Assume it will. Pick your landing spot while you still have the chance. Because once the obstacles are right in front of you, it's already too late. That's all for our today's video. Thank you for watching. See you guys in the next video.